we we do a lot of um, sort of family of origin stuff too. So we'll explore his childhood experiences first and foremost as a way of understand helping him understand what's what he's experienced and everyone's experienced trauma, Peter. Like it's, it's either big T or little T, but we've all been there, yeah. And so, for, and, and so once they're able to actually understand the impact that their own childhoods have had on their current behaviour and their current, I guess, personalities as they emerge, we have this sort of really weird shift in dynamic where you can see them empathising with their, with their younger selves, right, which, which then assists them with understanding their current selves. And then we, we talk very uh, educationally as well about the impacts of violence on children and what that looks like and things like attachment theory and, and, and how it disruptive it can be when those kind of relationships, those early childhood relationships are disrupted. So, hi, Tony. Hey, uh, I'm interviewing today. I'm interviewing today Tony Johansson, and um, Tony is one of our workplace mental health specialists. So he delivers uh, fa and facilitates uh, workshops for us in Australia, all over Australia. But you're located in Melbourne, right, Tony? Yep. Yeah, Melbourne, Victoria. Great. And also you dabble in men's mental health. Actually, I believe that that is one of your passions, right? Yeah, yeah, definitely, definitely. Look, I, it goes beyond dabbling, I guess, Peter. After all these years, it's probably probably my expertise, I would say. Yes. It's in men's, well, men's mental say. health and, yeah. Yeah, and that's, that's why I invited you because I wanted to hear from the horse's mouth what is happening for men's mental health on the ground. Um, now, you are in Melbourne, so we're kind of using M Melbourne as an example for what's happening in men's mental health around the world with the idea that, you know, men are men everywhere and what is impacting men's in Melbourne is probably what is impacting men's in Sydney, all over Australia and, and, in, in, and in any other parts of the world. So yeah. let's, let's start. Give us a bit of your background how do you get into men's mental health? How did that happen? And um, yeah, what brought you here? Okay. Um, uh, before I, I guess, upskilled as a counsellor, I was a, a tradesman and a, and a touring rock musician as well. I still play music as well. So I was, when I decided to change careers and go get a counselling degree, it was, a, it was a pretty good fit for me to work with men, given that I was already well-versed in sort of men's spaces, like building sites and, and rock and roll at that point in time was a very masculine activity as well. And so once I started working as a counsellor, I started working as a drug and alcohol counsellor and men are overrepresented in substance misuse, as, as we know, uh, which meant that the majority of my clients were male as well. And then I, I was also working with um, a lot of men who were on intervention orders with family violence related matters as well. So then I upskilled in that space as well and did some more, um, went back to university, got a few more tickets up my sleeve, I guess, and got qualified in working in that space. And so I spend a lot of my time working with men where there's been some kind of court involvement or some kind of uh, intervention orders or things like that, where there's substance misuse, where there might be family violence, things like that. It's, it's where all those things meet is, is really where I sit. That's where my expertise is. But I also just work with men more broadly as well, just in generalised mental health, depending on the circumstances. So it's fairly heavy. You're very much at the cold face when, when men are having problems in the family, domestic violence, they're looking at, at, well, they're in the legal system, obviously, yeah. and uh, they're looking pro potentially at being um, put in jail. Is that right? Yeah, yeah. It's, it's, I, I, I try and position myself as, as, as early intervention with the services that I'm involved in and the programs that I design and implement. Um, however, sometimes that early intervention still might have involved a, a short custodial sentence, um, but ho hopefully not for men who are, who are too far entrenched in the criminal justice system. You know, my passion is trying to, to assist men with, with, I guess, being diverted out of that space, learning some skills, getting to know themselves a bit better, understanding how their behaviour impacts other people, all in the effort of, of keeping men out of the criminal justice system. And, and for how long, how long have you been doing this for, Tony? Um, this, that kind of specialist work that I'm describing now would be about three to four years and then just generalist um, sort of drug and alcohol work and generalist mental health work and counselling and therapy and things like that. It's about eight years now, I think, all up. Yeah. 
Um, and look, when I when working at the coal face, unfortunately, eight years is, is a long time. A lot of people don't don't last that long. So, yeah, I've been around for a while, considering considering some of my um, contemporaries. Yeah, yeah. I, I remember many years ago working in Sydney in mental health services that we develop alliances with drug and alcohol services. But it, it was it was always a, a bit of an, an easy alliance um, in the sense that like, I mean we got along famously, but it wasn't very clear when to refer to each other. Yep. And sometimes we over-referred like, oh, no, no, this is not a mental health issue. This is a, na- a drug and alcohol issue. Uh, or this is a drug and alcohol issue. Or <laughs> if they went yeah. to drug and alcohol services, they would say, no, no, that's not a drug and alcohol issue. Yes, he is using drug and alcohol, but that's because they've got a mental health issue. But you yeah. seem to have been able to work across both. Yeah, it's, right? it's not... Yeah, it's not, it's not easy though, Peter. It's, it's, it takes a lot of groundwork as far as relationships go. Um, and by relationships, I don't mean with clients, I mean with, with stakeholders and things like that. Um, for the same reasons, you know, if, um, I've, I've had that same experience and still do with mental health and drug and alcohol, whereby I might say, look, I'm, I'm, I'm not willing to work with this man's drug and alcohol issues until there's mental health involved and mental health physicians are the same, you know, so, it's, so we hopefully learn to collaborate. Um, and with family violence, it's the same as well, where there's always been a siloing. It's like, no, if there's if, if a man's been using family violence and he has to deal with his family violence and his drug and alcohol concerns are completely different. So to blend the two, which is what I do, uh, it's has, it's not traditionally done. It's 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 quite innovative. There's a few other people doing it now and a few other services, but it's we're right at the start of that conversation and right at the start of exploring other ways of assisting men and their families where there's both alcohol and mental health and family violence. So it's it's a pretty new space. So what what kind of men? end up in in the mental health slash family violence system that you end end up um, helping is it is it like rough men is it like a laborers with, with very little education or, or, or what is it it is the same as sort of substance use and mental health Peter. it's pretty much some demographics might be slightly more represented than others right but it's it's the guys i work with it, it can be anyone really it's like if you if you think of there's a fine line right between family violence and a dysfunctional relationship at the start. Like once, once a dysfunctional relationship progresses into family violence, if, if that's the case and the family violence becomes entrenched, then there's, then there's a big difference right between family violence and a dysfunctional relationship. But if you intervene with families and people at the start, there's some commonalities. And so if someone calls the police, if a neighbour calls the police, it could be the first time that that family's ever had any interaction with the justice system whatsoever. So a lot of my clients... Uh, you know, uh, and rightly so, are really quite terrified by the whole prospect of having to go to court. And it's a really new experience for them. They've got businesses they're trying to run. They've got to get their kids to school drop off tomorrow. And they spent last night locked up in the cop shop. So it was a really different, terrifying experience. And then some of the guys I work with have been in and out of the system longer than I've been in the role. So it's, you know, it, it, it's a really broad spectrum, Peter, which means that I guess I've got to speak a lot of different dialects of the same concepts. I can imagine, I can imagine, because it's very, very different to deal for someone that is used to the legal system that is, uh, you know, um, to be called into court and because of domestic violence um, to someone that has never had any problems with police, all of a sudden having had to go to court or even spending a night in jail. uh, That must be very, very terrifying, yeah. So how do you help men, uh, uh, how do you help men in this situation, because a lot of people will be saying, you know, well, you know what? They deserve to be there. Yeah. And maybe yeah, yeah. They, they, they harden their hearts a little bit. But what yeah. have you found? Well, one of the challenges is that the sort of they deserve to be there approach is that there's, there's little to no evidence to support that a punitive approach to any kind of offending behaviour actually works. You know, it's, it's, I mean, corrections in itself is meant to, correct someone's behavior so the correctional institutions their role i mean it's i think we forget that part of the component but their role is to actually help people change their behavior not not punish them and there is a desire to punish people that that engage in what's you know offending behavior whether it be family violence or drug dealing or whatever it is uh the problem is right the evidence doesn't support that that really works yet we have to do something so there's a lot of education both for myself i guess as an advocate for, for people that have transgressed the law, whether it be family violence or other things. So having conversations like this, but then if I'm working with the men themselves, again, there's a lot of education. And so depending on 
his level of comprehension with with what's going on in the space he finds himself in that really de that that determines where my in is but a, a lot of it is assisting him with understanding my entry point generally is something along the lines of what i'd call emo emotional literacy that would be my start point depending on risk and then then i use that as a framework to to bring in all sorts of other things but i mean i guess my question is how do you how do you want to conduct this part of the conversation do you want me to talk through from go to woe, what it looks like, or, yep. or yeah, okay. Please, so, yeah, I'm, yeah, yeah. so some I'm, of your I'm, wisdom. Ideally, thank you. <laughs> Look, I, I, ideally, Peter, I would start from from a position of what we, you know, what we'd call psychoeducation, right? Where where we're going to do some some talking in a therapeutic standpoint, but I also have some explicit things that I want this guy in front of me to have better comprehension of. So one of them is being able to articulate emotion and being able to understand that there's more than just glad, bad, and sad. And there's, there's a bit of work that goes into that. Some of that might be um, through dialogue and, and not always overt. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Not always overt. Some of it might be covert, but a lot of it's really explicit. Oh, um, I have some, you know, there's handouts and diagrams and we use kind of visual aids and all this kind of stuff. And, you know, we challenge men. We will talk about it. We'll say, so what happened? What was the situation that brought you here? And generally it's something to do with being angry or pissed off or something. And, and so we'll challenge even just that, that word to describe that feeling. And then we'll drill down and we'll, we'll look for two or three other descriptors and then we'll assist him with exploring how much the story changes when he uses different words to describe his emotions, for example. And so that's that first part of that really cognitive part of understanding your emotions. And then we do a bit more um, sort of somatic stuff as well. And then we, we're really big on assisting them with understanding the fight, flight, freeze response and how that affects their body. And really, I mean, what we're trying to do there, Peter, is when they become aroused or angry, we're actually assisting them with employing mindfulness techniques by being really mindful of their body as to what happens at that point in time, not with the other person in front of them that's making them mad as such. So there's a lot of education in that space. So, so what you're talking about is basic, well, basic, a little bit more than basic communication skills, right? When I feel something, instead of going into the the immediate violent anger response or aggressive i'm, I'm yeah. sure not all of them is violent but it can be um, verbally aggressive well, it's, a, it's a spectrum stop, honestly, of all sorts of things. Stop. <laughs> stop think about exactly what's bothering you and talk and maybe even start talking even before it becomes an emotional issue a big one yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, that's a, that's a slow burn, and for, for a lot of guys, the, the sort of communication element of it is a lot further down the road. First and foremost, we just want we we want them to be able to identify they they're having an emotion other than anger, right. or if it is anger, are there other words, of, other ways of describing it? We we assist them with understanding how, you know, that sort of old Freudian that, that anger might be repressed sadness, or sadness might be repressed anger, that kind of stuff. Um, so we explore all the things that sit underneath that, and what that means is. We're inviting him to, to tell us his story. Yeah? So you can imagine if, if he's considered to be an offender of family violence, then there is some resistance from, from other stakeholders to invite a man to tell his story from an empathic standpoint if, if we're seeing him as a perpetrator of violence. It looks like we're uh, colluding with his behaviour to some degree, and I understand the resistance to that. But I, I personally don't believe that we can assist somebody with, with empathising until they can empathise with themselves. Now, a lot of the guys I work with don't know how to empathise with themselves, which means they have a very um, limited capacity to empathise with anybody else. So a lot of the work we do first is to identify the feelings cognitively, like what kind of words are we going to use to think and describe about how we're feeling? And then this somatic stuff, where do I feel it? And that's all that you know, central nervous system, fight, fight, freeze response stuff that we do in corporate training as well. It's really similar on that level. And then once we get to that level, when we're, when we're talking about his experience as well, we're, we do a lot of... Um, sort of family of origin stuff too. So we'll explore his childhood experiences. First and foremost is a way of understand, helping him understand what's, what he's experienced and everyone's experienced trauma, Peter. Like it's, it's either big T or little T, but we've all been there, yeah? And so, for, and, and so once they're able to actually understand the impact that their own childhoods have had on their current behaviour and their current, I guess, personalities as they emerge, we have this sort of really weird shift in dynamic where you can see them empathizing with their with their younger selves right which which then assist them with understanding their current selves and then we 
we talk very uh, educationally as well about the impacts of violence on children and what that looks like and things like attachment theory and, and, and how it disruptive it can be when those kind of relationships, those early childhood relationships are disrupted. And then once they really understand the effect it's had on them, then it actually becomes a lot easier to assist them with understanding the impact it has on their own children and their own partner. Um, most people just try and go straight in first and do the whole, you need to understand the impacts your behaviour is having on other people. And if, if you don't have a framework to understand your own experience, how can I empathise with you, Peter, if I don't even know my own feelings? So we do this preparation work that that is not part of traditional, I guess, interventions with a lot of men in this space. So it's it looks more therapeutic and you could consider it therapeutic, but but we think ultimately it's, it's a better way of, of encouraging empathy in a way that mitigates violence and mitigates aggression. And it's, it's, it's very important, the work that you do, because it's not about thinking, oh, this is a bad person, this is a bad yeah. man. It's yeah. not like, what, what else is going on? Why are they behaving this way? Why, why are they having this reaction? Most of the time, they don't even know why they're having that reaction. And this work of investigating, you know, what was, what, when did it start? Kind of a, a bit of a detective work and yeah. forensic work. And it reminds me, this morning, we had a bit of a meltdown with an eight-year-old. It's a boy. Yeah. And um, we, we turned up and he was yelling. And it, it was simply because today is sports day and he needed to bring his football socks, but he couldn't find the words. He was just a big emotion. And yeah. this emotion, he got frustrated and, and he blew up in, in, um, in yelling and all that stuff. But yeah. it, it was easily, it was about educating him, you know, hang on, find the words, what's going on, sit down. And, you know, find the words. And basically, sometimes it's, it's the same with, with grown men. Yeah. We, we yeah. have the emotion first, and then we need to go back and find the words. Hey, what else really the problem? Is that is that what you're talking yeah. about? Yeah, it's exactly what I'm talking about. Um, and the, the challenge is if, if guys are already sort of physically aroused or frustrated, and, yeah. and not just guys, it just happens to be that men are probably overrepresented. If, if yeah, humans, women right? too. Yeah, and so we've we've got to assist them with understanding first that they're actually really aroused, right? They've got to check in, and and so it's that metacognitive awareness for loss of a bigger word, Peter, where whereby we're really encouraging them to be curious about how they're thinking, not what they're thinking about, because you know when we get angry, we get very fixated on the on the thing that's making us angry, and we're less we're less curious about the fact that that we're angry. So there's a lot of that as well, really assisting people with being and assisting guys with being curious about that you're angry and how that feels and and why is it do you think you know rather than being um, obsessed or frustrated with the stimulus or the thing that's in front of you and all of those things are, are trying to slow it all down so that as with your experience with your eight year old you know so that this guy's got a better chance of at least finding some words to express himself yeah. before the whole thing explodes and when we meet them that opportunity is pretty small right between sort of stimulus response and and hopefully we, we do a 15 week program. Most of the work I do with guys, we just want to extend it. You know, it's like sort of any therapeutic work in the sense that you want to extend that, that, what do you say, gap between stimulus and response, something happened in your environment, how you respond. I think the difference with the work we do as well is that we're always inviting uh, the, the memory work with to understand how their behavior is experienced by other people as well. And I think that's a component that misses in a, misses in a lot of individual therapy. Like if, if I think if you're a, a, a man who's in a family with children sometimes individual therapy is too focused on your own experience and that's not necessarily to the benefit of you or your family i think some of some of the good things about group work and and behavior change programs and things like in the field that i sit in is that there is a lot of accountability to understand how your behavior impacts other people too and i know just as a facilitator i'm I would like to think I'm more humble now as a, as a man moving through the world, just understanding the impact that my behaviour can have on people that probably aren't as, don't have the physical presence or the social status that I do as well. I'm sort of I'm a lot more mindful of that now with the work I do. Yeah, yeah. So you, you also help the family to communicate, also to, to put words to what they're feeling, because, I mean, this is not a, a uniquely male gender problem. This is just, just a human problem. I mean, yeah, yeah granted. Uh, because of our biology, men possibly are not as aware of of the the steps pre anger sometimes. So yeah. we need to be educated. Um, but it is not uniquely a male problem. And also the kids in the family are in in this. Are they communicating? Are they also bottling it up? And so I would imagine that that work is is really good. And when it works, it must be really rewarding. I would imagine. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, we, we had a group um, last night, and obviously I won't mention names and too many personal details, but it, it's right towards the end of the program. Um, and, you know, he's an interesting fella that, that we've had in this group. And the, the, this particular program that I run, uh, or the, that we that we run, I should say, um, is pitched for, for guys who have got pretty good cognitive capabilities. It's it's because of the psychoeducational component. They need to be reasonably clever people in order to engage in it. So it's not a one size fits all program. So you do have some in- interesting intellectual arm wrestles with some of these guys as well, because no one likes that cognitive dissonance of realizing they have to they, that they should change, right? So there's this. And anyway, after 14, 15 weeks, um, one chap in particular, one of his closing statements. We just, you know, do checkouts every week like you do. And it was something on the lines of, yeah, I kind of get it now. It's just, it's really about transcending my desire to be right. Like if, you, if I don't need to be right, if I just want to express myself and then try and understand the person in front of me, then we probably aren't going to get into conflict. And so to have those kind of revelations, like from anyone, Peter, right? Like, I mean, if you and I can transcend the need to be right, we're in a good space. So to hear that from a client, that that's sort of somewhere, that that's where they're heading, some of these guys. Yeah, it, it is incredibly rewarding. Wow, that's great! And you've seen probably you've seen a few families come together after that, and yeah, uh, relationships yeah. saved and yeah. flourish. It's not just about saving a relationship; but is it flourishing? Yeah, and if the other side of the coin being that if, if people are to remain separated, that that it's amicable, you know, that they're not at each other's throats and they're not they're, they're putting the children first. And you know, a lot of these guys really understand the impacts their behaviour have on on young kids as well. Um, we we do a lot of work around the impacts of violence on children. And that's something I think that, I mean, you and I wouldn't have had any idea how our childhoods in, impacted us until we started becoming trained professionals. Yeah. Like, yet that's something we should probably know as a community, you know, that should be something that's, that's readily available, that information. It shouldn't be held under lock and key for healthcare professionals. And, and also, you know, how our family history impacts on, on, on how we communicate. You know, it, it is so ingrained into us as kids that we don't even realize we're doing it. We copy the mannerisms from our parents. We copy the mannerisms of our family groups. Yep. And, and that is normal. That is how you get socialized. But if that hasn't happened properly, you know, then you have to start learning. And it doesn't mean that you're a bad person. It just means yep. that you need to learn certain skills. Yeah, you just need to and, pick up a few trips. Yeah. Yeah, just need to pick yeah. up a few more so, skills, as you were saying. Yeah. So how would, what would you say, now that you have worked a few years in this, yeah. what would you say would be a great step forward in terms of systems to, to help around this domestic violence? And, well, I, w- I would la- rather concentrate, what would help men's mental health? Since yeah. 80% of suicides in, in, some, in some countries is men. Um, that's a huge problem. So what would you yeah. say, what can we do to improve from, from your uh, perspective, men's mental health overall? I, I think um, oh, that's a big question. <laughs> it is. I, I yeah, went to answer it. I had about 40 ideas and I was thinking, okay, let's, let's distill this. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll start with the work that I do and what would help that. And, and what would help that, I think, would be um, I don't know if it's legislation, but definitely buy-in right from the from the private sectors to assist men and their families with engaging in treatment. Uh, one of the biggest things that blocks guys out of programs that, that that I'm involved with is that they conflict with work, or they've worked a long day and now they've got to go and do two hours of sort of behaviour change work on top of that. And meanwhile, you know, before before they had an intervention order, they might have been the coach at their son's football team and now they can't work on Thursday night, you know, all these kind of things. People have lives, right? And mm. so I would think that some kind of, that some, some mechanisms, mechanisms, whether they be health policy or legislation change, I'm not sure to the degree that we'd need it, but that make it very difficult for employers to not support men going through treatment of any kind, right? Whether it's mental health support, whether it's behaviour change treatment, Whatever it is, uh, even just seeing their therapist, like whatever that looks like, drug and alcohol support. If if a guy needs to go into a detox program for for, for ten days because he's drinking too much and he wants to change his relationship with alcohol, I think all of these things, from a, from a remuneration standpoint, they, they should be there should be support for the work these men miss, um, because obviously a lot of these men consider themselves 
you know, being a provider is really important to a lot of the guys I work with. That A, can be problematic, but B, can also be leveraged for, for growth and change. And a lot of their employers, like if you're a tradesman and you're suddenly not going to be, if, you're, if I'm working casually and now I'm not going to be at work for the next three weeks because I've got to go to detox and then do two weeks in rehab because I've, I've been smoking too much ice, for example, and I'm going to lose my job as a result. I think that's a terrible place we've got to as a society where we can't safeguard employment for, for men who are entering into therapeutic programs to try and become better people and better fathers. So that would be, I, would, I don't know how you'd go about orchestrating that, Peter, but, but I think that yeah. would be an incredibly helpful component first off. And I think there's all these other sort of broader social things going on, obviously, okay? Like masculinities, in some elements, in some walks of life, it looks like it used to. In other walks of life, it looks completely different. Um, I wouldn't even know how to articulate masculinity anymore in a way that doesn't make it sound pathological. And so I think that in itself is a problem, right? I, I think there's, I just think there's so many beautiful things about about being a man and about having male friends and about engaging in uh, in sort of, Activities that are sort of focused on male camaraderie and things like that. As I said, I've, I've been a tradesman. I've, I still play in rock and roll bands. I've, I've probably seen my male friends now more than I'm getting older um, than I did when I was younger. I was, I was more than happy to mix with them when I'm younger. But now I've sort of really craved my time and, and cherished my time with my male friends. And so I think having a, a more nuanced conversation about that and, and, and honouring the beauty of, of men helping each other and supporting each other and, and being really mindful with, with how we employ the term toxic masculinity. I'm not, I'm not saying that it's not justified in some circles, but I don't think it's helpful to use it as a broad sort of sweeping brush whereby any time men want to succeed as a collective or support each other, it's viewed with suspicion. I, I, I don't think that's helpful for men at all. No, I agree. It's not helpful um, because it, 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 it taints the, the conversation. You know, not, yeah, there are some men that are bad men, you can say that, but it's not the majority. It's a small percentage. It's the same way that there are bad women, but it's not the majority, you know. Yeah. And to, yeah, yeah. to paint all with the same brush, you know, it, it wouldn't be. It's not fair, and it causes more problems than it solves. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, yeah, definitely. It's but I mean, as, as to how you go about, it's such a nuanced conversation, Peter. And I think that a lot mm. of times now, when it comes to, uh, if it comes to men's generalized violence or men's family violence. Uh, men's mental health, all these kinds of things. We, I think we come in with some pretty sweeping statements and we come in with some really broad generalisations. And there's some commonalities, of course, right, with these guys that I work with. And I work with guys all from all walks of life. You know, I can have a group with one guy who's unemployed and has been so for a long time, with a few self-employed tradesmen who are probably homeowners and some of their kids go to private schools, a guy in international finance sitting next to them and a few engineers. Like, it's really broad cross-section. And so without question, right, there's commonalities that, that, that guys... Uh, meet on and that if we address those commonalities i think we could ease to some degree some of the challenges men feel but there's also a lot of nuance right like there is with anyone and so i think we, men like any other citizen also deserves to be treated like an individual with their own sort of idiosyncratic challenges and that just saying men do this or men do that is, is quite unhelpful for a lot of these blokes i think and, and, and it is unfair and just as well because we're also different. Yes, we are the same, but we are different. And we yeah. bring our own problems, we bring our own desires, our own wants, our own needs. And it doesn't yeah. make us any more of a man or any less of a man. And to be helped, to be able to communicate somehow what we need, I think it's a, it's a, it's a beautiful work that you're doing there, Tony. So yeah, thanks, Peter. In very, very elucidating. And I'm sure anyone that watches this video, I, I hope that they stay until the end because this is words of wisdom. You know, it's about increasing the level of love and compassion in the world towards each other. And, and guess what? That benefits families, relationships. You know, a lot of people are out there I see that are wanting to have that beautiful relationship with, with another human being where they feel supported, they feel loved, they feel accepted. And this is part of the work that you do. You know, yeah. you help people come together because when one of us learns to communicate and say, hey, wait a second, my, my boundaries have been violated, but now I can, I can communicate that in an appropriate way that is not destructive. Wow, that's such a huge step forward, not just yeah. for that person, but for that family and for that community. You know, yeah. and that's, we need a lot more than of, of, that, of that kind of uh, help and, and 
and education, absolutely. Yeah, yeah definitely. And I think that's one of the things too, Peter, is like um, a, a lot of the men I work with are like, okay, I know I've done this, I know I've done that, I understand the impact, I understand, but what what now? And I think we miss that component, right? It's not just about getting men to be accountable. It's, it's assisting them with learning skills in a really compassionate way and understanding that, that, it, that men like anyone else just want to be a better version of themselves for those around them, you know, regardless yeah. of whatever behaviour they've engaged in. Absolutely. I have, I'm yet to meet a man that, is, that wouldn't die for their family. I honestly say that. You know. Now, are they able to communicate that? No. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. The majority were not able to communicate that, yeah. but, but we're willing to do that, you know, and that's yeah. beautiful. And how do we tap into that and how do we encourage that? That's and Exactly. And I'm, I'm yet to work with a man who, once he understands that his voice is not the import, most important voice in the house and that his wife or partner has feelings just like he does and that she too deserves a seat at the table and an equal stake in things, most men, once that, once that penny drops, right, it's not as if they go, oh, bugger that, she's a woman, I'm not going to listen. It's, most men are quite happy for that, for that understanding. They're like, I've never thought about it before. I've never realised how hard she works for the family before as well. Like, it's, it's not, this is not something that men, once they understand, wish they didn't. Like, they, they're grateful for, for an opportunity to, be, to, to, to have more empathy for their families and to have a better understanding of the work that everyone, everyone does to contribute to the family, not just them as the bread, the bread winner or whatever it is. Like it's, it's men, once, they, once they're on the train, they're pretty generous with, with, with wanting to understand other people's positions. We've got to get them on that train, Peter, and that's not an easy ride at times. <laughs> it's a bit of a quest. It's a quest. Yeah, but I'm, I'm pretty glad that you're part of that. And I'm also glad that you're part of the WMHI and, and can share your wisdom also yeah, yeah. in our work. Because I'm sure people will, will love that kind of aspect. You know, we are, we're starving for more love, kindness and attention in the world. So thank you. Um, thank and you, thank you for telling your story and, um, and bringing your wisdom. I'm sure a lot of people will benefit. And for all Thanks, of you brother. listening, you have enjoyed this. Please like and subscribe and give some comments uh, or ask some questions and, yeah. and we'll be able to answer those. Yeah, thank you very much, Tony. Yeah. Thank you, Peter. Hi, I'm Emmy Golding, Director of Psychology for the Workplace Mental Health Institute. We hope you liked the video. If you did, make sure to give it a thumbs up. We have more and more videos being released each week. So when you subscribe, you'll get a notification letting you know when a new one's just been published. So make sure to hit that subscribe button and don't miss out on this vital information for yourself, your colleagues and your loved ones.